Ms. Majority Leader. A quorum call? Yes. I ask consent to be vitiated. Without objection. So S 1243 is now pending? That's correct. I have a cloture motion, which is it that I'd ask the, with the chair's permission to have that reported? The clerk will report the cloture motion. Cloture motion. We, the undersigned senators, in accordance with the provisions of Rule 22 of the Standing Rules of the Senate, hereby move to bring to a close the debate on S-1243, a bill making appropriations for the Departments of Transportation and so forth and for other purposes, signed by 18 senators as follows. Madam President, I ask you now to consent to reading the names be waived. <coughs> Without Madam objection. President, before I go further here, I want the senator from Washington and the senator from Maine to hear what I'm saying. And that is this. Um, I would love to process amendments. We're going to do one in the morning, which is going to help things up for some time now. There are other amendments pending. I, we can have votes on those. I'm not, no problem with that. I, I just think that this is a piece of legislation that we should pass. I heard the ranking member speak on the floor yesterday. It could have been the day before. But I was so impressed because she said what is true. That's what we are. We're legislators. We pass this here. We, everyone knows what the number is we pass here. We go to conference. What happens at the conference? The numbers change. That's the way things should happen around here. So I would hope that we don't have these lines drawn in the sand and that we can start being appropriators again. When I came here these many years ago, I was so fortunate. Only two freshmen got on the appropriations committee. I got on it and Barbara Mikulski. And I loved that committee all these years, and it was so much fun. It hasn't been much fun lately because we haven't had an appropriation committee that's been functioning decently. Barbara Mikulski, I'm sorry, yes, Barbara Mikulski and Shelby are legislators. They want to do legislation, just like the man journal, the two managers of this bill here. So I would hope that we can move forward. I have no problem with um, the Colburn amendments, the Paul amendment. <clears throat> let's, let's vote on them and move on. But the time has come that we have to... <clears throat> try to uh, <clears throat> get past. You know, the week's going to a close. We have other nominations. We have to move to things when we get back here. We know all the problems we have when we get back. I'd, li <clears throat> I'd like to do some more appropriation bills when we get back. <clears throat> so, I ask consent that the mandatory requirement ruled, uh, required under Rule 22 be waived. Without objection. So I now ask consent to send proceed to pre morning business centers to this week up to 10 minutes each. Without objection. Senator from Colorado. Madam President, uh, I welcome this opportunity tonight to speak on the floor about the National Security Agency surveillance programs, their effectiveness in their future, and I'm proud to be joined by uh, my colleague uh, from Oregon, Senator Wyden, who will comment uh, as well after my remarks. Um, he's been a stalwart leader on these issues, and uh, it's been my honor to join uh, forces with him to draw attention to this really important discussion that uh, President Obama uh, recently welcomed. Uh, he called for a public debate on finding the right balance between national security and privacy in the context of NSA's surveillance programs. And his call, uh, Madam President, is long overdue, and it's an opportunity we should not squander. Uh, I've said time and time again to Coloradans, and they've said back to me as well, we owe it to the American people to have an open, transparent debate about the limits of the federal government's surveillance powers and how we reconcile the need to keep our families safe while still respecting our hard-won constitutional rights to privacy. Now, Madam President, I uh, would have preferred that this debate would have been kicked off uh, by the more transparent actions uh, by the White House instead of by unauthorized leaks. But we are nonetheless presented with a unique opportunity, an opportunity to finally have an open dialogue about the limits of our government's surveillance powers, particularly those relating to the vast dragnet of Americans' phone records under Section 215 of the Patriot Act. Would my friend be willing to yield for the United States? I, I would be happy to yield to the Majority Leader. I appreciate the courtesy of my friend from Colorado and ask uh, his statement not appear interrupted in the record. 
Without objection. I ask unanimous consent that the cloture motion with respect to calendar number 220 be withdrawn and that a time to be determined by me, and notwithstanding Rule 22, in consultation with Senator McConnell, the Senate proceed to executive possession to consider calendar number 220, that there be two hours for debate equally divided between the proponents and opponents the following the use relating back to that time. The Senate proceed to vote with no intervening action or debate on the nomination. The motion to reconsider be considered made and laid on the table with no intervening action or debate, that no further motion be in order, that any related statements be printed in the record, and that President Obama may be immediately, immediately notified of the Senate's action, and the Senate then resume legislative session. Is there objection? Without objection. So ordered. Madam President, as I was saying, we have a unique opportunity to engage in an important discussion and debate about the power of the federal government to put in place a vast dragnet of Americans' phone records under Section 215 of the Patriot Act. This is a debate I feel very privileged to take part in. It's a debate that Senator Wyden has been a part of since before I was even elected to the Congress and one that I've been engaged in for a number of years now. I want to be clear. I've acted in every possible way that I could within the confines of our rules that protect classified information to oppose these practices and bring them to light for the American people. I have fought against overly intrusive sections of the Patriot Act and the FISA Amendments Act and registered objections repeatedly with the administration. I believe that these efforts are critical for protecting our privacy and also ensuring our national security. Madam President, I serve on both the Senate Armed Services Committee and the Senate Intelligence Committee, and in those assignments. I focus every day, every day on keeping Americans safe at home and abroad. I recognize that we still live in a world where terrorism is a serious threat to our country, to our economy, and to American lives. Make no mistake, Madam President, our government needs the appropriate surveillance and anti-terrorism tools to combat the serious threats to our nation. But it is up to the White House and the Congress to ensure that these tools strike the right balance between keeping us safe and protecting our constitutional right to privacy. This is a balance I know we can achieve. But in my view, the Patriots Act bulk phone records collection program does not achieve that balance. And that's why I'm here on the Senate floor with my colleague Senator Wyden to call for an end to the bulk phone records collection program as we know it today. Two years ago, we were here on the Senate floor. We were considering extending certain Patriot Act provisions. And at that time, I argued that the sweeping surveillance powers we were debating did not contain sufficient safeguards to preserve the privacy rights of Americans. And in particular, I argued that the Patriots Act business records provision, or Section 215, permits the collection of records on law-abiding Americans who have no connection to terrorism or espionage. As I said at that time, we ought to be able to at least agree that an investigation under the Patriot Act powers should have a terrorist or espionage-related focus. We all agree that the intelligence community needs effective tools to combat terrorism, but we must provide those tools in a way that also protects the freedoms of our people and that lives up to the standard of transparency that our democracy demands. <coughs> Madam President, the Bill of Rights is the strongest document we have. Another way to put it, it's the biggest, baddest weapon that we have. We need to stand with the Bill of Rights and in this case, the Fourth Amendment. Following Mr. Snowden's actions and the subsequent declassification of information concerning the NSA's surveillance programs, Americans in recent weeks are coming to understand what it means when Section 215 of the Patriot Act says that the government can obtain, quote, any tangible thing relevant to a national security investigation. That is the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court's way of saying that Section 215 permits the collection of millions of Americans' phone records on a daily, ongoing basis. As a member of the Senate Intelligence Committee, 
I've repeatedly expressed concern that the FISA court's secret interpretation of this provision of the Patriot Act is at odds with the plain meaning of the law. This secrecy has prevented Americans from understanding how this law is being implemented in their name. And in my view and in the view of many Americans, this large-scale collection of information by the government has very significant privacy implications for all of us. What do I mean by that? Well, information about our phone calls, or as it's known, metadata, may sound pretty simple and innocuous. But I believe that when law-abiding Americans call up their friends, family, doctors, religious leaders, or anyone else, the information on whom they call, when they call, and where they call is from private information and should be subject to strong privacy protections. Now, I've heard it said that the bulk phone records program collects nothing beyond what you can find in a phone booth. But let's be clear about exactly what this program does. It collects the very personal details of our phone calls, the who, where, when, and how long, and stores them in a database. And this just doesn't happen for those who are suspected of having some connection to terrorism. This program collects the phone records of literally millions of Americans. This is a far greater intrusion into our privacy than being voluntarily listed in the Yellow Pages. And it's the reason why I'm calling on the White House and the Congress to immediately reform this program. Madam President, again, let me reiterate that it's absolutely possible to have both privacy and security. Yet in the case of the bulk phone records collection program, Senator Wyden, I believe, we aren't getting enough of either. Not only does this program unreasonably intrude on Americans' privacy, but it also does so without achieving the alleged security gains. For instance, in recent weeks, the intelligence community has made new assertions about the value of recently declassified NSA surveillance programs. But in doing so, they have conflated two programs. Section 702 of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act regarding foreigners' internet communications and Section 215 of the Patriot Act regarding bulk phone records. It appears, however, that the bulk phone records collection program alone played little or no role in disrupting terrorist plots. Madam President, I say this as someone who has been fully briefed on these terror-related events. Nor has it been demonstrated that this program even provides any uniquely valuable intelligence. Therefore, saying, as the intelligence community has, that these programs together have disrupted dozens of potential terrorist plots is misleading. And while the intelligence community has been conflating these two programs, some of my colleagues in Congress just in recent days have been going even further to say that the phone records program alone has been greatly successful. They've said it has saved lives and prevented dozens of terrorist plots. As someone who's been presented with the same information as my colleagues on the much discussed 54 terror-related events, I have to say that I disagree. Again, I have seen no evidence that the bulk phone records collection program alone has played a meaningful role, if any role, in disrupting terrorist plots. I have yet to see any convincing reason why agencies investigating terrorism cannot simply obtain information directly from phone companies using a regular court order. It may be more convenient for the NSA to collect phone records in bulk rather than asking phone companies to search for specific phone numbers. But convenience alone cannot justify the collection of the personal information of millions of innocent, ordinary, law-abiding Americans especially when the same or more information can be obtained using less intrusive methods. A few hundred court orders per year would clearly not overwhelm the FISA court, and the law already allows for emergency authorizations 
to get these records quickly in urgent circumstances. Now, Senator Wyden and I are not alone in believing there is a more effective and less intrusive way to collect this information. Even before the nature of the bulk phone records program was declassified, there was support for narrowing the language of Section 215 from many members of the Congress of both political parties. And in fact, Madam President, when the Patriot Act reauthorization passed the Senate in 2005 by unanimous consent, it included common sense language that would have limited the government's ability to collect Americans' personal information unless there's a demonstrated link to terrorism or espionage. That language was designed to, among other things, protect our Fourth Amendment constitutional rights and put a check on government power. Now, while that language did not make it into the final conference bill, it demonstrated that bipartisan agreement on reforms to Section 215 is possible. Let's fast forward to 2011. The Senate again took up an extension of a number of expiring provisions of the Patriot Act. I offered an amendment drawn directly from the language in the Senate 2005 passed bill to narrow the application of this provision. That amendment, unfortunately, did not receive a vote. But in this Congress, I introduced bipartisan legislation with Senator Wyden based on that same language and that same set of principles. And we are now joined by a strong bipartisan group of our colleagues from across the country and all along the political spectrum, including Senators Durbin, Murkowski, Begich, Tom Udall, Merkley, Lee, and Heinrich. And our bill would responsibly narrow the Patriot Act's Section 215 collection authority to make it less intrusive on the privacy of law-abiding Americans. Our legislation would still allow law enforcement and intelligence agencies to use the Patriot Act to obtain a wide range of records in the course of terrorism and espionage-related investigation but it would require them to demonstrate that the records are in some way connected to terrorism or clandestine intelligence activities, which is not the case today. This past week, Madam President, there was a strong bipartisan vote in the U.S. House of Representatives to curtail NSA's bulk phone records collection. And although the legislation didn't pass, the American people are demanding action, and those who share our concerns are on the march. It is time to take action. It's just common sense that our law enforcement agencies should have a reason to suspect a connection between the records they are seeking and a terrorism or espionage investigation before using these broad authorities to collect the private information of Americans. If the government can use these powers to collect information on people who have no connection to terrorism, then where does it end? Is there no amount of information that our government can collect that would be off limits? What's next? Our medical records? We must be able to put in place reasonable measures that allow our law enforcement agencies to pursue enemies who would try to harm us while protecting our rights as Americans. That's why I believe that if an investigation cannot assert some nexus to terrorism or espionage, then the government should keep its hands off the phone records of law-abiding Americans. These are the kinds of reasonable, common-sense limits on the government's powers that Coloradans tell me are necessary to keep us safe while also respecting our privacy. And that takes me back to the statement I made at the outset. I believe it is time to end the bulk collection program as we know it. Tonight I'm calling on the White House to begin to make the administrative changes to end the bulk collection of Americans' phone records and to conduct the program instead through direct queries to phone companies where there's a connection to terrorism or espionage. Under this more targeted approach, our government would retain its broad authorities to investigate terrorism while ordinary Americans would be protected from overly intrusive surveillance activities. 
Congress should support the administration's move in this direction by passing our legislation to end bulk collection. Passage of our bipartisan bill would prevent unwarranted future breaches of Americans' privacy rights and focus on the real threats to our national security. Taking into account the serious privacy concerns raised by the bulk collection program, the lack of demonstrated unique value of the program, and our ability through direct queries to the phone companies to collect the data in the same but less intrusive ways, I believe the administration, I hope the administration, will see the value in working with Congress to end the bulk collection of phone records conducted under the Patriots Act's Section 215 authorities. I pledge to work with the administration and all of my colleagues to see this through. Madam President, let me end on this note. We need to strike a better balance bet between protecting our country against the threat of terrorism and defending our constitutional rights. The bulk records collection program as we know it today does not meet this balance test, and that's why I believe it must end. Thank you, Madam President. I yield the floor. Madam President. Senator from Oregon. Madam President, before he leaves the floor, I just want to tell Senator Udall how much I have appreciated having him there in that intelligence room because he has been a strong advocate for making sure that our country can have security and liberty in those classified meetings just as he has been here tonight. And it is just great to have you on uh, the committee and to have you as a partner in these efforts. And you are so right when you state tonight that this is a debate that should have begun long, long, long ago. And it's a debate that should have been started by elected officials and not by a government contractor. So I very much appreciate your remarks. And I think you made this clear that we're going to stay at this until we get it fixed, and I very much appreciate your leadership. Madam President, as Senator Udall has made clear, these issues are about as important as it gets. When you're talking about how you can secure these bedrock American values, security and liberty, this is right at the heart of what Americans care about most. And for too long, Madam President, my view is the American people have essentially been presented with false choices. Americans have been told you really can have one or the other. You can have your security or you can have your liberty, but you really can't have both. And suffice it to say, Madam President, in the last eight weeks as this debate has evolved, I think Americans have come to understand that this set of false choices is not what this debate is all about, and they deserve better. As this debate has unfolded, whether you're in a lunchroom at work or a senior citizen center, or you're looking at a political opinion poll, Madam President, Madam President, the polls have changed something like 20 points just in the last few weeks, with Americans saying that particularly the bulk phone records collection program is an intrusion on the rights of law-abiding Americans. So whether it's what citizens say at town hall meetings or what they say in the company lunchroom or in senior citizen uh, centers, is Americans have uh, come to understand that these false choices are not what the discussion is all about. Americans have really come to figure it out. And frankly, a big part of the problem in the past, and I documented it last week, is leaders in the intelligence community have made misleading statements repeatedly. It's not just a question, Madam President, of keeping the American people in the dark, which was true, but the American people were actively misled on a number of occasions. And Senator Udall and I have been 
walking everyone through that, the bulk phone records collection program is often compared to a grand jury subpoena approach. That's about as far-fetched as it gets, Madam President. Even national security lawyers have made fun of that kind of argument in publications like uh, the Wall Street Journal. Very often when I talk to lawyers, the distinguished president of the Senate is, of course, a particularly illustrious lawyer and has taught in the field. I often uh, say when I'm visiting with, uh, with lawyers or ask for a show of hands, anybody know of a grand jury subpoena where you can go out and have the bulk collection of millions and millions of phone records of law-abiding Americans? Come on up to me and tell me after the meeting is over. I don't exactly get swarmed, Madam President. The reason is there aren't any. And one of the reasons I wanted to touch on these misleading you know, statements is that just in the last few days, as Senator Udall you know, touched on, there's really been an effort to take the two programs. <clears throat> One of them is called the FISA 702 program, the PRISM program, which targets foreigners and has useful value. We've made that clear it could be improved. <clears throat> and I came to that conclusion, Madam President, when I was finally able to get declassified a finding from the FISA court that on at least one occasion the Fourth Amendment had been violated in connection with the use of the 702 program. But even with that, I'm of the view that that provides useful value. But what a number of the leaders of the intelligence community have done is essentially commingled their advocacy of these programs so that 702 and the bulk collection program essentially ride you know, together, when in reality 702, which Senator Udall and I have supported, and I think we can improve it with these privacy reforms, in effect, 702 does all the work, and the bulk collection program, which does intrude on the rights of millions of law-abiding Americans, essentially along for the ride. But you wouldn't know that when you hear these statements from a number of the leaders in the intelligence community when they just say these programs, of course, are what keeps us uh, safe. Now, in addition, Madam President, I thought it was important to briefly start this evening by mentioning that over the last few days, there have been a number of comments about whether the Patriot Act has violated the rights of Americans with respect to this bulk collection program and a number of commentators and others have said, where are the violations? Haven't seen any, you know, violations. Well, the Director of National Intelligence, Madam President, said last Friday in a letter to you and I and Senator Udall and 23 other of our colleagues is yes, there have been violations of the uh, Patriot, you know, Act. When he said specifically that the government had violated court orders on the bulk collection of those phone records. And Madam President, I'm not allowed to discuss the classified nature of that, but I want to make sure that those who are following this debate know that from my vantage point, reading those documents that are classified, these violations are more serious than have been stated by the intelligence community, and in my view, are very troubling. So I do hope that senators will go to the intelligence committee and ask to see those classified documents, because I think when they read them, I think they'll come to the conclusion I've come, that not only is what was stated by the Director of National Intelligence in that letter that was sent to you and I and Senator Udall and 23 other senators. Not only was that correct, but I think that senators who read those classified documents 
will also come to the conclusion that the violations are more serious than uh, I thought, than, than uh, the intelligence community uh, portrayed. So let me, if I might, talk a little bit more about why we've spent several years examining this bulk phone records you know, program. First, I think it's important for citizens to know that the ability to conduct this secret surveillance that lays bare the personal lives of millions of law-abiding Americans, coupled with the ability to conjure up these legal theories as to why this is acceptable, and then have such limited oversight through this one-sided adversarial FISA court, in my view, is an opportunity for unprecedented control over the private lives of Americans. That's really why Senator Udall and I uh, have spent uh, all this uh, time focused on this uh, issue. Now, I thought I'd also tonight, and haven't done this before, provide a little bit more history into how we got to this particular uh, place. When I came to the uh, Senate, you know, early uh, on, I had a chance to work with a number of uh, colleagues who really saw the extent of these problems early on. One of them was our former colleague, Senator Russ Feingold. Senator Feingold saw the problems that the Patriot Act posed before they were apparent to many senators, and he and his staff took their responsibility to protect both American security and American liberties very uh, seriously. So in 2007, the two of us came to understand that the Patriot Act was being secretly interpreted to justify the large-scale bulk collection of ordinary Americans' records, and we made it clear that we thought, first of all, that was something real different than what Americans thought was going on. Thought it was real different, for example, in the plain reading of Section 215 of, uh, of the Patriot Act. And we thought that the language of the Patriot Act had really been stretched beyond recognition because the language in the Patriot Act really spoke to relevance and a sense that it was relevant to suspected terror activity rather than something that created this enormous leap from what was in the statute that called for relevance to collecting millions and millions of records on law-abiding people. So Senator Feingold and, and I dutifully set about to write classified letters to senior officials urging them to make their official interpretation of the Patriot Act public. And we said at the time that for intelligence activities to be sustainable and effective, they have to be based on publicly understood laws and be consistent with Americans' understanding of their own privacy rights. This, in our view, was clearly not the case with the bulk records collection because, of course, the government's official interpretation, the Patriot Act, was a tightly guarded secret. So back then, in those early days, we were rebuffed when we made these repeated requests that the intelligence community inform the public what the government had secretly decided the law actually meant. And in fact, there was a secret court opinion that authorized massive dragnet domestic surveillance, and the American people, by that point, were essentially in the dark about what their government was doing with respect to interpreting an important law. In 2009, as the expiration date for the Patriot Act approached, Senator Feingold and I began to caution our colleagues and the public that our people were not getting the full story about the Patriot Act. At that time, we had the good fortune of having uh, our colleague, Senator Durbin, on the committee, and we all wrote public letters. We authored various articles, the editorial pages of the newspapers. We made statements for the congressional record. We raised 
issues about this to the extent we could at public hearings. But of course, the Senate rules regarding the protection of classified information limited what we could say. Mr. President, one point that I've tried to make clear is the intelligence rules, the classification rules, don't let a member of the committee tap the truth out in Morris code. You have to comply with the rules, and they are very laborious. And if you don't comply with the rules, you can't serve on the Intelligence Committee and be a watchdog for some of these efforts, which we think go right to the heart of protecting American security and American liberty. So we decided, those of us who, a small group of us who shared these views, we decided if we wanted to have that opportunity to play that watchdog role, we needed to work within the rules. So we did everything we could, recognizing that you can't tap out classified information in Morse code to alert the public about what was going on. After a series of short-term extensions, the Patriot Act came up for a long-term reauthorization in the spring of 2011. By that time, Senator Feingold had been replaced on the committee by Senator Udall. He, as colleagues know, shares these concerns about the bulk collection of phone records on millions of law-abiding Americans. And we're lucky that he's been a prominent leader in the cause of protecting security and liberty. So during that 2011 reauthorization, Senator Udall and I spoke to colleagues, invited colleagues to secure settings to really lay out what was actually happening. And many of those colleagues joined us on the floor to uh, opposed the extension of the Patriot Act for four more years. During that debate, Mr. President, I came to the floor and said, when the American people find out how their government has secretly interpreted the Patriot Act, they're going to be stunned and they're going to be angry. That week, the Senate voted to extend the Patriot Act until 2015, but those who opposed the extension continued the fight in the months that followed. At that time, the NSA was also conducting a bulk email records program in addition to the bulk phone records program that is ongoing today. Senator Udall and I were concerned about this program's impact on our liberties and our privacy our rights. And back in the Intelligence Committee, we spent a big chunk of 2011 pressing intelligence officials to provide evidence of its effectiveness turned out that the intelligence community was unable to provide any such evidence. Intelligence agencies had made statements to both Congress and the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court that they had significantly exaggerated the effectiveness of the bulk email program. And when Senator Udall and I pressed them to back these statements up, they couldn't do it. The bulk email records program was shut down that year. Our experience with the bulk email records program showed us that the intelligence agency's assessments about the usefulness of a number of these particular programs, even big ones, are not always accurate. Now, that doesn't mean that intelligence officials were deliberately lying. As far as I, I can tell, in a number of instances, they believed their claims that the bulk email surveillance program was effective, even though Mr. President was actually close to worthless. This was an important reminder that even if intelligence officials are well-intentioned, they can be dead wrong, and that any policymaker who simply defers to intelligence officials' conclusions without asking to see their evidence is making a mistake. As we looked at that evidence, Senator Udall and I found that the claims about the effectiveness of the bulk phone records program also did not seem well supported by the facts. So in March of 2012, we wrote to the Attorney General expressly with this concern. In our letter, we said, and I quote, in recent months, we've grown increasingly skeptical about the actual value of this intelligence collection operation. We added, and I quote, this has come as a surprise to us as we were initially inclined to take the executive branch's assertions about the importance of this operation at face value. The Department of Justice unfortunately decided not to respond to our letter, but we continued our efforts to educate the public 
and to call out senior officials from intelligence agencies and the Department of Justice as they repeatedly made misleading statements about domestic surveillance. In June of this year, disclosures by the Washington Post and the Guardian newspaper revealed the fact of bulk collection to the American people. This sparked the debate that is now ongoing about whether or not hoovering up the personal records of ordinary Americans is the best way to protect our security and our liberty. This debate, as I've indicated, Senator Udall was on the floor, should have started a long time ago, but I'm sure glad, Mr. President, that it is finally happening now. The fact of the matter is that Americans' phone records can reveal a lot of private information. If you know, for example, that somebody called a psychiatrist three times in a week and twice after midnight, you know a lot about that person. And if you're vacuuming up information on whom Americans call, when they call, and how long they talk, you are collecting an astounding amount of information about a huge number of law-abiding Americans. The intelligence agencies try to emphasize that they have rules about who can look at these bulk phone records and when. But, Mr. President, I want to emphasize this, because I think after all of the talking on cable and the talking heads on, on TV, I want to emphasize none of these rules require the NSA to go back to a court to look at Americans' phone records, and none of these rules erase the privacy impact of scooping up all of these records in the first place. On top of that, as I indicated at the beginning, there have been a number of serious violations of those rules. For the senators who got the letter last Friday, you know that. I want to tell all the other senators on both sides of the aisle that the violations that I touched on tonight were more serious, a lot more serious than the public has been told. I believe the American people deserve to know more details about these violations that were described last Friday by uh, Director uh, Clapper. Mr. President, I'm going to keep pressing to make more of those details public. And Mr. President, it's my view that the information about the details, the violations of the court orders with respect to the bulk phone record collection program, the admission that the court orders have been violated has not been, uh, I think, fully fleshed out by the intelligence community. And I think considerable amount of additional information can be offered without in any way compromising our national security. Now, if the impact on America's liberties wasn't bad enough, it's made even worse, Mr. President, by the fact that this program, when we've asked and we've asked and we've asked, does not seem to have any unique value. And I'll explain briefly what it means, uh, Mr. President. Uh, I would ask uh, for, let's see, how about seven additional minutes? Ask unanimous consent. Without objection. All right. And I'll see if I can beat uh, the clock here, because I know colleagues are here as well. And in fact, Senator Baldwin has been a great advocate for liberties and showing that liberty and, and security are, are compatible, both when she was a member of the other body and here when she was part of our group. And I thank her for it. Mr. President, intelligence officials can only point to two cases where this program, the bulk phone records collection program, actually provided useful information about an individual involved in terrorist activity. In both of these cases, the government had all the information it needed to go to the phone company and get an individual court order or an emergency authorization for the phone records they needed. In both of these cases, the individuals who were identified using these phone records were arrested months or years after they were first identified, but if government agents had felt that the situation was urgent, they could have used emergency authorizations to obtain their phone records more quickly. I'm glad both of these cases resolved the way they did. I'm proud that our intelligence agencies and law enforcement uh, individuals were able to identify and arrest those who were involved in terrorist acts. In one case, four men in California were arrested, were sending money to a militant group in Somalia. In the other case, uh, a conspirator of Mr. Zazi, a few months after Zazi's plot was disrupted 
one of those individuals was arrested. These men committed serious crimes. They're now being punished with the full weight of the justice system. What I don't see, however, Mr. President, is any evidence that the U.S. government needed to operate a giant domestic phone record surveillance program in order to catch these individuals. I have seen no evidence, none, that this dragnet phone records program has provided any actual unique value for the American people. In every instance in which the NSA has searched through these bulk phone records, it had enough evidence to get a court order for the information it was searching for. And getting a few hundred additional court orders every year would clearly not overwhelm the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court. The intelligence agencies may argue that collecting Americans' phone records in bulk is more convenient than getting individual court orders, but convenience alone does not justify the massive intrusion on the privacy of ordinary Americans. I believe it's vitally important to protect the safety and the liberty of our people. I don't see any evidence that this program helps protect either. That ought to be the standard of any domestic surveillance uh, program. If the bulk collection program doesn't protect privacy or security, then it ought to end, plain and simple. And the executive branch simply hasn't shown anything close to an adequate justification for this magnet, massive dragnet surveillance that has compromised the civil liberties of millions of Americans. I'm not sure they ever could, but I'm confident that I haven't uh, seen it as yet. Now, Mr. President, let me uh, close by way of saying that over the last uh, few uh, weeks, we've seen extraordinary support for reform. Last week, over 200 members of the other body voted to end the bulk phone records collection program, and a number of the members who voted against ending it at that time made it clear they have serious concerns they want addressed. So there are going to be more votes, Mr. President. Make no mistake about it, there are going to be more votes on whether to end the bulk collection of phone records on law-abiding Americans in the 113th Congress. And there are going to be efforts to reform how the entire U.S. surveillance system works. One of the most important reforms will be to make the significant rulings of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court public, which is a goal that I've been pursuing for several years. Additionally, I believe Congress needs to reform the process for arguing cases before the court. Right now, the government lawyers walk in with an argument for why the government should be allowed to do something, and there is no one to argue the other side. That's not unusual if a court is considering a routine warrant request, but it's very unusual when a court is doing major legal or constitutional analysis. I believe that Congress needs to create a way to advocate for the public, a public advocate, to argue cases before the court because making this court more transparent and more adversarial is a way to ensure that Americans can have security and liberty. And, of course, the relevant provisions of the Patriot Act itself will be expiring in 2015. I don't think there's any reason for the administration to wait for Congress, you know, to act. The executive branch can take action right now. They can and should continue to obtain the records of anyone suspected of connections to terror or other nefarious activity. And at the same time, they can restore protections for Americans' Fourth Amendment rights. I'm very interested in working with the administration on these issues, but they can move of their own volition. So one way or another, Mr. President, we are going to stay at this until at this unique time in our constitutional history, we have revised our surveillance laws so that we can have security and liberty. And colleagues are coming to this cause. Senator Blumenthal has uh, particularly recommended a number of constructive FISA court uh, changes over the last uh, few months. I hope colleagues will support that, and I hope they will see at this unique time in our history that uh, it's critically important that these surveillance laws that I and Senator Udall have uh, talked about uh, tonight can be reformed, and we do it so as to protect those bedrock American values, both security and liberty. With that, I yield the floor. President. The Senator from Rhode Island. Mr. President, may I uh, ask unanimous consent that I and Senator Blumenthal from Connecticut 
and Senator Baldwin from Wisconsin, and if he's able to join us also, Senator Murphy from Connecticut, uh, be allowed to engage in a colloquy on the floor. Without objection. Thank you. Uh, Mr. President, my colleagues and I have come to the floor today to talk about an issue that is at the heart of the discussion of our national debt and deficit, and that is health care spending. These days, around Washington, there is a regular refrain echoing through the hallways. In order to fix our deficit, we must cut Medicare and Medicaid benefits. Well, that is wrong. That idea is, according to the former CEO of Kaiser Permanente, somebody who knows a little something about health care, and I'll quote him, so wrong it's almost criminal. It's an inept way of thinking about health care. I could not agree more. It was put this way by Froh Maharup, who's a columnist for my hometown paper, The Providence Journal. I'll quote her. The dagger pointed at America's economic viability hasn't been the existence of government programs like Medicare. It's been the relentless rise in health care costs that plagues not only Medicare and Medicaid, but everyone who uses health care. Attacking Medicare and Medicaid ignores the fact that our health care spending problem is system-wide and not just unique to federal programs. Our colleague, Senator Angus King, has used the colorful metaphor that to go after Medicare and Medicaid when the problem is our health care system would be like attacking Brazil after Pearl Harbor. Wrong target. It ignores the fact that we operate a wildly inefficient health care system. 18% of our GDP compared to only 12% for our least efficient international competitors. So how can we continue to stem the rise in costs and improve our wildly inefficient health care system? Well, thankfully, many of the tools necessary to drive down costs have an interesting collateral benefit. They actually improve the quality of care for patients. The Affordable Care Act included 45 different provisions dedicated to redesigning how health care is delivered for the benefit of patients and taxpayers. These reforms support and encourage an ongoing delivery system reform movement, and there really is a, a movement out there driven by dedicated providers, payers, employers, and even some states that have worked for years to improve the quality and the safety and the effectiveness of health care. We're not discussing hypothetical improvements we're not discussing theoretical cost savings. Today, Mr. President, I'm joined on the floor by colleagues who've seen how delivery system innovators in their states have achieved real improvements to quality, real improvements in patient outcomes, and real cost savings. Here in Congress, we can't get over yesterday's quarrels about repealing or defunding Obamacare, but out there in the real world, Healthcare leaders across the country are innovating forward. Places like the Cleveland Clinic in Ohio, Intermountain Health in Utah, Geisinger Health System in Pennsylvania, Gunderson Lutheran in Wisconsin, Palmetto Health in the Carolinas, and in Rhode Island, among other places, our own Coastal Medical. One Rhode Island practical example, when intensive care unit staff follow a checklist of basic instructions, washing their hands with soap, cleaning a patient's skin with antiseptic, placing sterile drapes over the patient, and so forth. Rates of infection plummet, and the costs of treating those infections disappears. No infection, no cost. These reforms have the triple benefit of protecting Medicare and Medicaid, improving patient outcomes, and dialing back health care spending for all Americans. How big is it? Well, the President's Council of Economic Advisors has estimated that we could save approximately $700 billion, that's billion with a B, $700 billion 
every year, every year in our health care system without compromising health outcomes. The Institute of Medicine took a look at the same question. They put the savings number at $750 billion. Other groups are even more optimistic. The New England Health Care Institute has reported that $850 billion could be saved annually. And the Lewin Group and former Bush Treasury Secretary Paul O'Neill, who as the CEO of Alco was deeply involved in the reform efforts in Pennsylvania that have been very successful and who knows a fair amount about this, they estimated annual savings of a staggering $1 trillion. Whatever the exact number is, what's clear is that there is huge potential for savings in our health care system while improving or maintaining the quality of care. And since the federal government does 40% of America's health care spending, when you get that right, taxpayers as well as patients become big winners from these reforms. I'll close with two points. First, many of us are asking the Obama administration to set a hard cost savings target for these delivery system reform efforts. If it's $750 billion, pick a number that will be your target to be actually achieved. A target, a measurable goal, will focus and guide and spur the administration's reform efforts in a manner that vague intentions to bend the health care cost curve simply cannot. Second, we need to put the full force of American innovation and ingenuity into achieving that serious cost savings target for our nation's health care system. It's hard to do that without that target to strive towards. This is an issue where our Republican colleagues should be able to join us to accelerate these reforms in our health care delivery system and to move forward beyond tired out calls to repeal Obamacare so that we can deal with the ongoing reality of health care reform. So let's give American families the health care system they deserve. Instead of wasting inefficiency, poor outcomes, and missed opportunities, let's give them a health care system that is the envy of the world. I yield to my colleagues. Senator Baldwin. Well, I thank my colleague for convening us and for giving us an opportunity to discuss the important topic of delivery system reform and to highlight some of the innovations that are occurring in our own states. Um, I heard Senator Whitehouse talking about moving forward. It's actually the motto of the state of Wisconsin. One simple word, forward. And throughout our state's history, that motto has, I think, well represented our leadership in extending high quality and affordable health care. Our health care providers and payers have uh, pioneered forward-looking reforms that improve the quality of care and lower costs for families and for businesses. We are home to world-class, highly integrated health care systems. We make quality and outcome data widely accessible to providers so that they can measure their success against their peers. And we stand at the forefront of using and advancing healthcare information technology. All of this affords some of the highest quality care in the country at a competitive cost. Congress has a lot to learn from Wisconsin's healthcare delivery systems. A recent Institute of Medicine report reinforced what we have known for a long time the geographic variation in healthcare spending and utilization is real, and that variations in healthcare spending are not consistently related to healthcare quality. For every state like Wisconsin with higher quality outcomes and lower cost, there are five other states faring worse. Even within states, the regional variation in healthcare spending and quality is troublesome. Unfortunately, instead of advancing and fostering forward-thinking innovations like those working in Wisconsin, far too many of my fellow lawmakers are looking backward when it comes to health care. In the House of Representatives, the Republican leadership has scheduled uh, votes to repeal or defund the Affordable Care Act almost 40 times. 
Some state governments, including unfortunately my own, have refused to move forward with America's new health care law and are undermining its effectiveness at every chance possible. Now some of my colleagues in the Senate are threatening to shut down the government if investments in our health care system are not stripped out of our budget entirely. Families and businesses in Wisconsin and across the country are tired of these political games. For as long as some of my colleagues and some of the governors across this country remain glued to the past, waging political fights based on pure ideology, we lose golden opportunities to move health care reforms in our country forward. We should all be focused on building a smarter and more affordable health care system, not trying to tear down the law of the land. That's why I'm so proud to stand on the floor with my colleagues tonight, committed to moving our nation's health care system forward by building on the best reforms uh, to our health care delivery system that are embedded within the Affordable Care Act and making new improvements as to how we deliver care in our country. We will lower health care costs, improve quality, and strengthen our economic security and reduce the deficit. Better yet, we will have more states with health care systems like Wisconsin's, and Wisconsin's system will be improved as well. You know, the possibilities are exciting, and I think one of the things that Senator Whitehouse just mentioned bears repeating. There is widespread agreement that significant savings can be achieved in our health care system without compromising the quality of care. And the figures that he cited bear repeating. The Lewin Group and the former Treasury Secretary Paul O'Neill have estimated that we could save one trillion dollars per year without affecting health care outcomes by enacting smart, targeted health care delivery reforms. The New England Health Care Institute pegged that number at $850 billion annually. The Institute of Medicine estimated this number to be $750 billion. And the President's Council of Economic Advisors foresees saving $700 billion a year. No matter the exact figure, these are impressive savings that would strengthen our entire nation. The Affordable Care Act has sparked this hard work of transforming health care delivery. The law provides health care practitioners with incentives to better integrate care, increase quality, and lower cost. And these efforts are producing impressive results in Wisconsin. For example, the Pioneer Accountable Care Organization program has offered financial incentives to meet quality and Medicare savings benchmarks. Bell and Theta Care Health Care Partners in Northeast Wisconsin has excelled with this program. In its first year of participation, Bell and Theta Care earned $5.3 million in shared savings and lowered costs for its 20,000 Medicare patients by an average of 4.6%. While not every pioneer ACO has been as successful, the CMS, uh, CMS Office of the Actuary believes that this program could save Medicare up to $1.1 billion over five years by simply better coordinating care. Wisconsin boasts six additional health care providers participating in the law's traditional uh, accountable care organization program, with the, uh, which the Department of Health and Human Services estimates could save up to $940 million over four years. Wisconsin health care providers are also taking part in the Affordable Care Act Partnership for Patients to Improve Health Care Quality. This public-private partnership engages hospitals and businesses uh, consumer groups with the goal of preventing injuries and complications in patient care, including hospital-acquired conditions. The administration estimates that reducing medical errors and preventing conditions will save up to $35 billion in health care costs. Another public-private partnership, the Affordable Care Act's Million Hearts Initiative, is preventing heart attack 
and stroke. Cardiovascular disease costs this country $440 million per year in medical costs and lost productivity. The initiative seeks to deliver better preventative care to stop one million strokes and heart attacks by the year 2017, in part by utilizing innovative technology. Wisconsin's own Marshfield Clinic designed a winning mobile application for the initiative. The app will encourage patients to get their blood pr pressure and cholesterol checked and to work with their health care providers to improve their heart health. Finally, the Affordable Care Act has empowered the CMS Innovation Center to develop new ideas to improve health care quality and lower costs for people enrolled in Medicare, Medicaid, and the Children's Health Insurance Program. A number of the center's projects are currently underway in Wisconsin. For example, the Children's Hospital of Wisconsin, Aurora Healthcare, and the Wheaton Franciscan Healthcare uh, System have created a model to decrease emergency room visits for children. The estimated three-year savings of that project is almost three million dollars. In addition, the Pharmacy Society of Wisconsin, in utilizing a provision uh, in the Affordable Care Act, is better uh, integrating pharmacists into clinical care teams. That initiative is set to save over $20 million in three years. You know, this just represents a small sampling of the de delivery innovations being promoted through the Affordable Care Act that are saving us money right now. These parts of the law are empowering Wisconsin health care providers to provide higher quality care at reduced costs. Public officials who advocate for repealing the Affordable Care Act would end these impressive initiatives as well. Instead, we really must build on these delivery reforms as so much more can be done. To name just two priorities, Wisconsin cardiologists have developed an innovative integrated network called Smart Care to deliver better, more efficient care for a vulnerable patient population. The Department of Health and Human Services should encourage this coordinated care model by investing in it and measuring its results. And we should improve the law to increase access to Medicare claims data. The Wisconsin Health Information Organization currently holds over 65% of health insurance claims data in the state from private insurers and from Medicaid. The organization shares that data with healthcare providers so that doctors can compare their performance in terms of quality and cost against their peers. This data sharing promotes competition and it lowers cost. But due to current law, the organization cannot access Medicare data. If we open up Medicare claims data, we will further improve quality and we will lower costs. Lawmakers have a clear choice. Go backwards and try for the 40th time to repeal the Affordable Care Act or put progress in our country ahead of politics. We welcome our colleagues to join us in moving our country and our health care delivery system forward. Uh, and I would uh, now yield to Senator Murphy.